sleep, but then they put mint in water and they're still having symptoms. Four to six weeks. It takes a long time for things to heal, so we have to be patient. And she said, if you're going to cheat, don't cheat at nighttime. If you're going to cheat, do it in the daytime. Let's say you have to have a tomato. Don't have it at 9 o'clock at night. Have it at 9 o'clock in the morning. Because sometimes we also, a lot of people, we don't realize, and I didn't put this on the slides, but a lot of people have little tiny sliding hiatal hernias. And they don't even realize it. Maybe they're not mentioned in the EGD. Maybe it wasn't visualized in the EGD because it's not always there. So when you bend, we shouldn't squat. We shouldn't bend over, right? When you're getting things out of the dryer, squat, don't bend over. Because that, if you have food in your stomach and you have a hiatal hernia, guess where it's all going to go? Everything's just going to reflux up. So how, our, how we pay attention to here will make a difference. And the more belly we carry, the more likely it's going to reflux up. If you have a high is your reflux going to be worse? Yeah, very possibly. Okay. That's where lifestyle is so important. <clears throat> chew on food. Right, I was mentioning this earlier. No one's going to chew their food 30 times. It's just not going to happen. I eat a lot of soup, so it makes it easy for me anyway. Try not to eat when we're stressed out. A lot of people eat when they're stressed out. It's better to actually not eat when you're stressed out. Because think about it. If your body's in fight or flight mode. All the energy is diverted, and all the blood flow technically is diverted where? To your muscles to run away, to your lungs, to your heart. Your stomach has to have blood flow, and if the blood flow is being diverted away from it, how can your stomach do its job properly? So try not to eat, or stay in clear liquids. So that way the food, when you chew it, breaks down properly at a later time. We already talked about fatty, spicy foods. Chocolate is an issue. Weight is a huge issue when it comes to reflux. Uh, because of the stomach, right? It pushes up the diaphragm. Everything gets displaced. And we, we're all sloppy about our bending over behaviors. Exercise has been shown to help reflux. I, I kind of think that exercise is helping because it's going to decrease stress. Right? Why do we feel that? I, again, I have family members that have got several of them are sick, but have got some health issues right now. I was feeling the stress coming up on myself. So instead, what did I do? I just got on my Stairmaster the other night, 10 o'clock at night for 45 minutes. I felt much better. Because I took all that stress energy and I moved it to kinetic energy. So that's why I like exercise. We're carrying this energy. We need to move it somehow. Walking, boxing, something physical. I don't think most of you realize what we can do about how we sleep. Now, if you have a hiatal hernia, you can buy a very expensive bed. It's great. It'll just elevate the head of your bed just enough that you won't have reflux because of a hiatal hernia. Or you can get a big body pillow, put it underneath your mattress. Your head just has to be up enough, right? So things don't reflux back. And if we're talking about sleeping on your left side, it's better. And then elevating the head of the bed. I'm not a huge fan of the ketogenic diet unless it's for cancer or seizure or if you just are using a little bit of it to jumpstart weight loss. But this study actually showed if a high-fat diet causes esophageal microenvironment, this, the microbiome gets affected with too much fat in our diet and can also set us up for uh, inflammation inside of the stomach and the esophagus. Unconventional methods for reflux. We have to stop eating crap. We really do, right? Processed food, eating out too much, eating too late, too many carbohydrates. It, it really is a causal factor of indigestion. We can alkalize our body. You can, most of us who have an age on this, we remember the biggest treatment for reflux was what? Baking soda water. You go get your baking soda, you put a teaspoon of it in a cup of water, and you drink it. Alkalizing also is breathing. Eating a plant-based diet is a way to alkalize your body. Lemon water. I've seen a lot of people have success with a little apple cider vinegar. Right? They have they have they have good success with that. Probiotics, digestive enzymes, natural food that has digestive enzymes with papaya and mango, right? Ginger can be helpful. Did you get your pictures? I see you can take okay. the Mediterranean diet. Again, you hear me talk about it every single time. There's actually studies showing the Mediterranean diet. Eating a Mediterranean diet will decrease reflux. Cool, huh? So it's not only good for 
lowering inflammation. They also do other things. Remember when I mentioned that a lot of kids gas rides, we talk about stress, right? What do they do? They rest. They get better sleeping patterns. They have social structures. We need a social support system. I, tell, I, I see a lot of people and they feel alone in this world. They feel alone. So when you're feeling alone, you have to develop social circles, either through your church or <coughs> doing volunteer work. We need social structure. It, it's not like when I grew up. I mean, I grew up and I knew all, I knew my, my grandparents and my great grandparents and all my aunties. We had a lot of family. We lived in a small community. We pick up a phone and you had support from anybody. A lot of people don't have that now. So our stress feels higher because we do feel alone. Eat seasonally, eat diverse foods. Remember, food is healthier when the, from the time it's picked. You're going to get more energy from photosynthesis, right? So the faster you eat it, if you pick it up from your own garden, it's going to be a better, it's going to have more energy for you. Again, I've mentioned this before, the Blue Zones is a must read because it will really help you understand the concept behind the Mediterranean lifestyle. I put this slide in here because uh, to motivate us all, we know that we have better brain health eating a Mediterranean diet. And it's because of the antioxidants we believe in the olive oil. So olive oil, a lot of olive oil has been cut with canola oil. If you have a good olive oil, you'll know because it tastes different. You take a teaspoon of it, you put it in your mouth, as it's going down the back of your throat, it should almost be, it all should almost taste uh, dirty. Like, you, it, and it should burn. Those are the polyphenols. That's a good olive oil. That's a good, that's what you're looking for. Something that's got some bite to it. And a plant-based diet. The Mediterranean diet, this is the slide for, the, for this particular lecture, is it's protective to the GI tract. And they, they did a study showing this. So it's just not me just telling you one more thing, but there's some data to support this. This is how olive oil can protect the brain. It's the polyphenols. But again, it has to be a good quality olive oil. It's best uncooked versus cooked, right? We all know that we're going to lose some of the health benefits if we cook with our olive oil. I want to talk to you about a wonderful salad dressing I came up with. I took organic hummus, all right? Everything in plastic I take out and I put it to glass. I, the more you know, the crazier you're going to get, I promise you. And I put different spices in it. <coughs> then I took organic apple cider vinegar with some olive oil and to cut it so it was nice and thin. And that's my new salad dressing. So you don't have to buy salad dressing. It's got more body. It's going to be healthier for us, mm -hmm. right? It's delicious. And, you can, and it stays in the refrigerator because of the apple cider vinegar. It basically ferments. <coughs> so it stays in the refrigerator. I've got some in the refrigerator now for three weeks. No, no mold on it. So it's still good, right? <coughs> Back to the Mediterranean diet. Now, what's interesting about the Mediterranean diet, see at the bottom? Physically active. <coughs> Enjoy meals with others. Have a social framework. Eat whole real foods. <coughs> now, when you're trying to lose weight, you can't always have some of the foods because they're too high in the carbohydrates. So this is where there's no reason we can't have a green salad with every single meal. Right? We can put vegetables on it. So when I go to the store, I, I buy seasonally. I'll buy my stuff. I cook everything with all the different spices on it, and I put it all in the refrigerator. So when I have a salad, so I got all the things I need. If it's Brussels sprouts or if it's... Uh, cooked beets, or if it's some asparagus, it's all ready. So all I have to do is put on the salad. I got my salad dressing, and I can have that for breakfast with an egg. Or I can have avocado toast with a salad. Now, if you have digestive issues, we have to fix the stomach first, and that's the key. Not everybody can eat raw. Then you have to take your spinach and cook it first. But you can still have it with all the different vegetables. Again, we don't need that much protein, right? A little palm, palm, palm sizes, three or four ounces, that's plenty of protein. When we're eating fish, we have to be careful. Again, we have environmental pollution. We are not going to eat big pieces of tuna every single day because of what mercury. The same thing counts for our cows. It's, all, it's called bioaccumulation. If you're not eating a cow that's grass-fed, grass-finished, everything the cow ate is going to be in the cow. 
So you get a bioaccumulation. We're better off if we eat a calf. Or if we're going to have sheep, we're better off eating lamb. Right? We're better off if we eat a piglet. Or we can eat more plants because you're not going to have bioaccumulation. <coughs> and you see at the top, less sweets. <coughs> That's hardly any sweets, right? <laughs> but we're still going to have them, so pick and choose. But if you're going to have them like I had cinnamon toast last night, I have to fast. I mean, I have, if I'm going to self-regulate my health, I know what to do, and I'm going to talk about that. I found some new apps. They're great. Okay, so anyone who has, a, who has a kind of sophisticated phone, you can download an app. I really encourage you to do this. Zero app looks like an orange, I put moon, but that's because I'm doing it at 12 o'clock at night. Looks like an orange moon. Great app. Because what it does, it's, it's going to help you pick and choose when you decide you want to do restrictive eating. If you want to restrict your eating to 12 hours, you push the button. It's kind of a contest with yourself. And you don't eat. You can drink liquids, but you don't eat for that 12 hours, and it, the alarm will go off when your fast is over. If you decide you want to restrict your eating, that you only want to eat in an eight-hour window, that means you're going to do what? Fast for 16 hours. Can you exceed that window? You can, and then you get, I think they give you like some little smiley face or something like that. But the other part of the app is, one component of it is there's some research of why restricting our eating is so good for our health. So there is data that all these cultures in the blue zones, most of them, they restrict their eating, and more and more people are restricting their eating to an eight to nine hour window a day. I still think the best place to start off is with breakfast, having breakfast, having a lunch, eating a light supper, and be done eating by five o'clock. And guess what, if you don't eat breakfast and lunch, too bad for you. That doesn't mean you can eat at nine o'clock at night. It's not like it's a surprise we're going to eat again, people, right? We all know we're going to eat again. So we, we have to plan. We have to be prepared. We have to take the responsibility. Another one is the Mediterranean Diet app. I've looked, I haven't looked at all the apps, but I did look at a bunch of them. This one's free. I liked it because it had foods you could eat, foods not to eat. And there are also some recipes if you want recipes. But it also shows the re some research of why the Mediterranean diet is the healthiest diet on the planet. But if we have time, I was going to switch over to another lecture because with my stress in my life, I don't have the opportunity to switch slides. How do we do this? Oh, this is Jix. Jix. Okay. So again, here, hang on. Just this one. Yeah, we have had, uh, you know, all this uh, kind of information coming from WhatsApp that it's not good <coughs> to eat fruits with food together, that fruits should be consumed in empty stomach. Uh, You're saying people, consume fruits on an empty stomach? Yeah, there are people are like, advising I, I, that... I, I don't know, I haven't seen that. I, I can tell you that I think most of us are eating too much fruit. If you're trying to, If you're trying to lose weight, I tell my patients the only fruit I want you to eat is an organic apple. Apples are great for the colon. It's, it's broken down in the colon, it ferments, and it becomes food for the colon cells because it's just, it's a form of sugar. And what we're trying to do is minimize our carbohydrate load as well as our calorie load. Yeah. The single best way to lose weight is still calorie restriction. A 17 year old boy who runs track is a normal metabolism. I don't see any 17 year old boys in this room, right? <laughs> so what happens, and, and this is true for myself, I mentioned last time I'm 60 years old, I don't eat a lot of food, last year I had some health issues, I had to be on a lot of antibiotics, I was not cleared to exercise, I couldn't eat very much food. I didn't gain any weight, but I wasn't gonna lose any weight either. But this year, I'm, I'm cleared to exercise again, so exercise is a great way to be healthy, but it's also a way to improve your metabolism. And this is where they're now calling it said an exercise program, maybe even just a movement program, you know, getting in the pool and swimming or walking. Um, I use a Stairmaster. Uh, I, I think when we're carrying extra weight, we have to be really careful of our knee joints and our hips. So you, you have to think of a kind of exercise that you can do that will um, 
protect that because I've seen people blow up and they all of a sudden out of the air, out of the blue, decide to join a Zumba class. Zoom is great, but don't blow out your knee doing it. You have a question? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, would you recommend eating the foods before the meal or after the meal? I, I don't have any preference. I mean, I think if you if you're going to use fruit as a dessert, have it after your meal, mm -hmm. right? I think that. Um, we should think of fruit more as a dessert because we think of desserts as sweet. So I think it makes sense to our head. There, and that's why I like if you're going to eat something sweet, eat something real because we want our taste buds to actually experience that. That's why I don't like anything diet. I don't like anything that's not real. Yes. Thank you. Does the apple have to be organic? In my world, yeah. What was the question? It has to be organic. Oh, okay. Yeah. And if you have any questions about the nutrition and um, acid reflux, this would be a great and why do I keep talking about organic? Because these environmental pollutants are, end, are endocrine disruptors. We're seeing, I mentioned this in my last lecture on colorectal cancer, we're seeing earlier colorectal cancer. And as Dr. LaRoche agreed, everything sits in the large colon longer. And our body's trying to detoxify these things that I call poisons, right? They're poisons. They're poisoning us. Okay. Oh, she had a question in the back. Sure. She had, okay, you said, I, well, I work third shift. You so what? I work third shift. Third, so third shift. Oh, yeah. yeah I work third, third shift. shift people hate me when I tell them this. <laughs> <laughs> I had one person I thought she was going to hit me. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a problem by eating, and I'd be bloated, and it's just crazy. So, so how should I? If you want to eat to your circadian rhythm. Okay. Normal people who work normal shifts, mm -hmm. let's say we get up at 6 in the morning, mm -hmm. and we're supposed to go to bed at 8.30 at night, your metabolism is already going to be slowing down by late afternoon, mm -hmm. you still want to eat in the, your circadian rhythm window, right? Mm -hmm. That's the key, because you're, and that's why we see so many third shift people gain weight. That's what, this is what some of the researcher, Dr. Rhonda Patrick, she'll talk about this in her YouTube lectures, mm -hmm. you know, and and a lot of us who say, oh, well, I get off at 9, I need to have supper. Well, that's just a habit. That, you don't need to have supper at 9 o'clock mm -hmm. at night. It's just something we're used to doing. Mm -hmm. Or we think it's part of our social structure that, well, I want to have dinner with my husband and he doesn't get off till 9 o'clock at night. Well, can't we play Scrabble instead? I mean, can't we go for a walk? Can't we do something else as part of our social structure mm -hmm. instead of making everything revolve around food? When I grew up, we didn't have restaurants. We went out once a year to the Biltmore for Mother's Day, and it was all you can eat. And I, I'm sure they lost money on a family of you know, seven kids from a farm yes. in Iowa, right? <laughs> oh, Sunday, you know, yeah. Sunday after but church. I, so in her case, I'm sorry, so she would eat the, when you would be sleeping, basically, during the day? Or? Well, you could come home. Mm -hmm. I, eat, I eat breakfast. Right, that's, eat, that's okay. a better choice, right. But, uh, and you get up at 2, 3? Yeah, yeah, I get up 2, That three. would be your next meal. Okay. That's why I lay down. People like are seven. snacking in the middle I, of the night just yeah, okay. because they're bored or stressed. It's not because we're legitimately hungry. Okay. okay. Right? Okay. So that because when you get used to fasting, people <coughs> all say the same thing. My energy's better. Okay. I feel better. I can have better weight control. So if I like to usually fast two days out of the week. Right, where I might just eat one meal. Because that gives me lets me liberalize and eat or drink other times. Uh, when your weight is normal, people say, Well, I want to have some fun. You know, well then have breakfast here when you're coming here on a Saturday morning. But that might be your only meal today. I mean there's nothing wrong with that. Right? You know, none of every time we feel a little hunger pang, we all say, I'm starving. We all say it. I say it too. Are we really starving? We're not really starving. Right? We just say it. It's here. You should say, oh, that's good. Maybe I'll start breaking. If I don't eat, I'll just break down some more fat. That's what we should be saying. Right? That's a good thing to be hungry. Yes? When you say limit the carbs, what do you recommend daily? Like, the well, I, I, it really depends on someone's metabolism. But 
If you eat a Mediterranean diet without the lentils and the beans and some of the higher carbohydrate foods, and you focus on vegetables and greens, you're not going to eat that many calories. Because they're so, it, literally, you would have to have an entire pile of raw spinach to be 200 calories. And my next question is, okay, we're talking about the vegetables. Certain vegetables creates the, or, and, and inflammatory what, with the jerk. So like what, I, I know, that's why you have a lot of people who have re reflux. Mm -hmm. They wind up eating more soups and cooking them. And when, and, people say, and, and when people say, I don't like that, I'm like, I say I don't care. <laughs> because you, you still, and if your body's not used to good, healthy fibers, they have more gas until your body learns that this is a good, happy thing. And so they do better with the probiotics and the enzymes. Sometimes we add glutamine and aloe as the body gets adjusted to having whole real foods again. Um, so again, we talked about... This is Loma Linda, United States. It's the only place where there's a blue zone. I'll get back to that. <coughs> Look at all the different places around the world. This comes back to the blue zones. You'll hear me talk about it a million times. You'll get bored with me. Another place here. Well, we talk about supplements, and everybody wants to know, what do I believe? I believe the food that we grow currently doesn't have enough micronutrients. I watched a really excellent... Um, program recently and this expert was saying, I think a lot of times when people say they feel hungry all the time, it, the body is saying, I'm missing a nutrient. I need a nutrient. <clears throat> so when, and most people will say this, when they eat whole, real, nutrient-dense foods, they're just not as hungry. So I like the idea of the body saying, oh, I'm missing a B vitamin, or maybe I'm missing a vitamin C, or maybe I'm missing an amino acid, and it's searching for it so you feel hungry. To me, that kind of rings true in my head. I like that idea. Do I take, a, I take a multivitamin and mineral every day? I take high doses of omega-3, I take vitamin D3, and then you know I supplement some, with some other supplements. Tea, it's good for us, green tea, it's powerful antioxidant. Coffee is good for you, but if you have to like try to fix your reflux, you may be one of those people who can't have coffee, at least until your reflux is fixed. Flavor, add flavor to your food. That's why I say, when, I don't like hummus by itself. I think, I don't like, why would anybody eat it? I hate it. But man, when I, when I change it to a salad dressing and I add a bunch of spices from my garden and herbs, then it's, then it's good and it's tasty. Protein, again, we need less than we think. Two to three ounces. Um, I see a lot of people with renal disease because they're, they're bodybuilders. They've been taking creatine. They're eating a high protein diet. Protein's hard in the kidneys. The kidneys gotta move that protein when it breaks down. Mushrooms, so good for us. There isn't a soup I make that doesn't have mushrooms in it. I use a lot of dried mushrooms, too. I like a lot of the dried mushrooms. Whole soy is fine. Again, if, we can, if we're finding soy that isn't genetically modified, that's always the challenge. <coughs> Sardines. Again, the smaller the fish you eat, the less likely you're, you're going to have bioaccumulation, right, of heavy metals from the ocean. Fats are so good for us. Olive oil, nuts, seeds, avocado. <coughs> Grains are really good for us, but this is the challenge if you're trying to lose weight. You have to say, okay, and this is where some of the apps can be beneficial. I would say the majority of people do okay on 50 carbs a day. It seems doable when they're trying to lose weight. But you have to, I, I suggest that you start off with figuring out how many carbs are you eating first, right? Do, do, the, do the work and then say, okay, where can I cut? Because what I, like, what I like about my sister is she negotiates with her patients because this is a health journey. We do not have to eat the whole elephant in one day, right? I always sound like I want you all to eat the whole elephant in one day and make all these changes, but it's, it really is a health journey. It takes time. Pasta, you know, if you don't have a weight issue, pasta is fine a little bit. You know, that we know that a little bit of pasta is okay if you want to calculate that into your carbs or if you really have a craving, just have a little bit. Have it earlier in the day, don't have it at 9 o'clock at night. Beans and legumes, good for us. Now, what I like about, you have to cook these things properly. Pressure cookers are a great way to cook these because usually we have to cook down some of the um, uh, components to make it a healthier choice without get, causing a lot of gas. Anyone who's lived a long time, what, what do we do? We soak our beans, we rinse our beans, we soak them again, we rinse them, we soak them again, and then I cook them in a pressure cooker. 
de it will decrease the gas. Vegetables. You can't really, as long as there's a healthy vegetables on the to-do list, we really can't have too many because they're not high. I, I don't count calories. I don't count carbs. I follow a Mediterranean diet. I pretty much eat what I want. I do care when I eat, though. Fruits, berries, great for us. Apples, great for us. All fruits good for us. It just depends on can you handle that carbohydrate load for yourself as an individual. Water, you can't, water's so important, right? I, I say it a million times, I did not need Flint, Michigan to tell me I should filter my water, right? So filtering water is important. Oh, typo. So when we talk about weight loss, there's a lot of different ways we can do this. You can first do the homework, figure out how many calories and carbs are you eating. It's pretty shocking when you actually either weigh your food, measure your food, we're eating more than we think. Weight Watchers does have a, they have an excellent program. I still think they're letting people eat too much fruit, okay? But if you have what we call an external locus of control and you need that support, it's not expensive. I, and you can go to meetings, you can go to online meetings. Overeaters Anonymous is real. People do have food as an addiction. That's their go-to when they're stressed. And we have to think of food as in, it, the reason it's probably one of the most difficult addictions is because we can't live without food. We can live without alcohol, we can live without cigarettes, but we cannot live without food. People who don't have a heart condition or who um, have normal blood pressure or blood pressure that's controlled, they do really well to jumpstart weight loss with an appetite suppressant. You know, they're perfectly safe, all right? It's not, they tend to lose their effectiveness after three months. So, I, so what I try to tell people is let's work on all these lifestyle strategies when you're on the appetite suppressant, and when you're on an appetite suppressant, you're, it's considered a very low calorie diet. This was my, my this my dissertation was weight management. Mm -hmm. To go on a very low calorie diet, maybe two meals of 300 calories, and we expect to lose somewhere between eight and 12 pounds in a month. That's a lot of weight. People think, oh, it's not very much weight. It's a ton mm -hmm. of weight. That's a lot of weight to lose. If if you don't have a normal metabolism mm -hmm. and you're doing calorie restriction, I'm still happy if you lose two pounds a month. Mm -hmm. That's still 24 pounds in a year. Because when it comes to weight loss, it's the tortoise that wins the race because you're changing your lifestyle. And you have to live a lifestyle that fits you. I come from short people, right? I told my daughters a long time ago, you cannot eat the same as your boyfriend or your husband. You cannot drink, drink the same amount because guess what? You're gonna gain weight. They, they, have more they have more testosterone, so their metabolism is naturally faster. As we age out, our metabolism changes. So we just have to start get to where you want to be first, and then you figure out, okay, how do I regulate my weight? And that's, I think that's the key is the self-regulation. We can get weight off anybody. Because I promise you, no one in this room is eating air, right? <laughs> if we were eating air, we would disappear, right? So we just have to figure out what's gonna work for us. Then there's a new FDA-approved medicine called Contrae, right? It is a combination of Wellbutrin with Naltrexone. It was designed for the morbidly obese. I don't have a lot of people tolerate it because I think the Naltrexone dose is too high. It's expensive, it's 150 a month because insurance doesn't cover it. I use a lot of compounded low-dose naltrexone. That's a whole other conversation, but it does help with appetite, all right? But you have to do it all together as a whole plan. You know, there isn't just one simple answer. I still think, and I know they're, they're talking about, are they talking about the Aspire today? They're not going to. Okay, I do think that there are, there are some technologies that fit people better, right? I think that's one of them that can be helpful. You know, we still do a lot of, you know, different kinds of gastric surgeries. Most of the surgeons realize we have to do all this other stuff first because sometimes a surgical intervention it actually saves lives. You know, and I think that's where we have to pick and choose our battle for our patients. We do have a table patients. for Aspire. Yeah, if anybody that. wants information, they're here. That's one of the devices that we do a non-surgical right. weight loss for people who have a certain BMI. So you, have, you do have to have, right. um, you have to meet certain criteria. Yeah. But, and you want to say, gosh, I've done everything I can in my human power, I just need one more tool, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So um, that's really all I have to talk about today. I know a lot of it's repetition. Any questions on? Sure, in the back. Um, with just, uh, I'm actually hearing impaired, can you speak up? Oh, that, uh, there's uh, digestion, any of the digestive problems, um, drink, uh, uh, pain in the chest? Yes, they can. That's true. Well, because if it's refluxing, it's going to be referred into the esophagus, yeah. Yes? Can one, as a controlled diabetic, 
do some fasting. Oh, absolutely. And there are I, have, I have my type 2 diabetics, and, and there are some type 1 diabetics with some really progressive endocrinologists doing more of this as well. But the type 2 diabetics can do very well. And we still have to just make sure you eat your three meals and you can still do calorie restriction. I've had diabetics, as long as you have good beta cell function, come off all medicine. It's all about when you catch somebody in their disease process. Yes? I have two questions. The first one is, um, would that weight loss will cause pain on the arm, on the, you know, side of the, one side of the... I'm not seeing that, but, you know, again, it's referred pain. Shoulder and It's the referred pain. So what sometimes we'll do is somebody will come to the office and have any symptoms, as long as we don't think it's their heart, I give them a nitroglycerin, I'll give them a GI cocktail, which has some Maalox and some oral lidocaine in it, and it will numb the esophagus. And if all the pain goes away, then we know it's referred pain. And the second question is, which uh, which foods would you definitely not recommend if you have reflux? That list I showed you. Okay. And then you have to find out if you have trouble with raw foods. I talk a lot about raw foods, but if you are struggling with that, then I then we cook them, right? And protein again. If if pepsin is one of the issues, and our body's producing the pepsin as an enzyme, people don't do well with meat because you have to break it down. Remember. It's not just the chewing. We have pan we have enzymes, pancreatic enzymes, to break down protein, fats, and carbs. And we need those enzymes. That's why we find many cultures of people, as people age out, they take digestive enzymes with their meals, right? But you can also get that with foods, too, and fermented foods, and with probiotics, and papaya and mango. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Yes? Um, what tip would you recommend if you are trying to do a lifestyle change, but um, family and friends are Oh, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. And it's... All you can do is lead by example. Mm -hmm. I mean, when, <laughs> when, when, I, when, when I was married, I had two separate refrigerators. Mm -hmm. All my food went in one. Mm -hmm. I, it, it, this is a funny story because I'm redoing my cupboards and I'm painting them on the inside and I took a picture and sent it to my family. And my sister's like, well, where's all your food? Because she saw dishes and plates and spices and olive oil, because I don't have the doors on the cupboard yet. And I said, it's in the refrigerator, <laughs> right? I mean, that's what you want. You want your food in the refrigerator. Yeah, we want less packaging. I saw my, she saw my dried mushrooms. She saw all my different olive oils and my different vinegars and you know some, some things I have on the upper shelves. And, and she goes, oh, what do you eat? Right, <laughs> what am I eating? <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Know, my concern is uh, if there is anything, any relationship between any milk product, cheese, oh, no. yogurt. Oh, absolutely. I, and, and I do that in my office. I didn't see the picture. I, I, I didn't talk. bring that up, yeah. you know, because I mean, I could go on forever and all this. Mm -hmm. But we know people are having more food sensitivities, mm -hmm. right? We know people are lactose intolerant, yep. right? We know that's real. We, there is something called A2 milk that you can get in the stores now. It, it crazy as it sounds, it's, it's from a different cow. <laughs> and so it doesn't have the same lactose, and so there's not the same milk sensitivity. Um, what, what there, body there's body a body lot body of, body it's body called A, like the, 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 the letter A and then the number two. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, a lot of people do better with a hard cheese over a soft cheese, but if you, there, there is a lot of different uh, specialty laboratories where we can do food sensitivity testing, right? Of course, insurance doesn't cover it, so what I try to recommend first is a true elimination diet. Mm -hmm. can, can you substitute uh, soybeans, for example, milk or almond milk? Or well, the, the, prob the problem with soybeans is there's no soybean in the United States that's not genetically modified, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And anything processed, anything in a box, is going to be genetically modified. And my last lecture showed some slides where genetically modified foods don't have the same antioxidant potential. And again, there hasn't been enough, is it, there hasn't been enough studies really saying that these things are safe, and yet it's part of our it's part of our food culture now. I think what we're finding is that some people are adapting to these genetically modified foods, corn and soybeans, which are in a lot of foods, better than others, right? And some people can't tolerate them at all. We know a lot of food that is uh, has insecticides and pesticides on them, 
our body has to detoxify those, and that could be where some of the food sensitivities are coming from. Yeah. We're seeing more autoimmune diseases than we've ever seen. I think it's an accumulation of air pollution, water pollution, and food pollution, and waste pollution. You know, we just have to be aware of this and do the best that we can. Um, but an elimination diet, I had my dad do one many years ago. He had itchy skin, and he just went on a baby food diet. And he figured out, he was very diligent with it, he followed it 100%, and he kept adding new food groups until he finally figured out where, what was causing his itchy skin, and it was vodka. <laughs> so he stopped drinking vodka. My daughter Erica, my kids have been fortunate where I live is organic. My property's been organic for over 30 years. Right? I don't use any chemicals in my home. I've never used any Roundup on my property. They were blessed that way. She moves to New York City, and now she starts to get digestive symptoms bloating, you know, alternating diarrhea, not feeling good, you know, just not, you know, just not feeling good and healthy. So she went on a true elimination diet. She went on organic baby food. And she said, Mom, it's surprisingly satisfying. Everyone at work thinks I'm poo poo. But <laughs> after a period of time, she was able to figure out what was bothering her. And it was the fact that she had started eating bagels in New York. <laughs> So then she had to figure out, was it the cream cheese or was it the bagel? And for her, it was the bagel and the gluten. You know, a, a great um, Netflix show to watch is What the Health. Because when she watched that, she completely eating animal products. Because she just, she didn't feel psychologically that it was the right thing to do anymore. She didn't feel it was the right thing to do environmentally anymore. And she didn't feel that um, they were safe to eat. <laughs> So it was just easier for her to go off animal products. One more question. How about yes. exercise after you have Well, meat? I think exercise, most people find that you're better exercising on an empty stomach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, and you're gonna, when your body needs energy, guess what it's gonna do? If it's used it up in the muscle, the liver should release energy. And when that's all gone, guess what? Your body will break down fat, and that's the key. Mm -hmm. This white fat, is an energy source for the body. And unless you deprive it of easy mm -hmm. energy, which is the food we eat, it will never break it down. It'll just sit there waiting for a rainy day to be used up. Okay? If we detox the liver, does that help with the acid reflux? I don't know the answer to that. I, I, I really don't. I, I, a lot of people do detox. I think it's a great thing to do because of environmental pollution. It's easy to do. They're just supplements. The main, the main two ones in almost every supplement is going to be um, uh, N acetylcysteine and milk thistle, and usually with some other things added. But I, and I've seen liver function tests improve, not if they're 500 in terms of the ALT, but if they're in the high 40s, I've seen them reverse. But I also take people off alcohol when they're detoxing as well. So it's probably a combination. Yes? Where do we get um, the real um, olive oil? Olive oil, yes. Where do we get um, Where do we find the olive oil? Oh, yeah. oh, well, right now there's a lot of olive oil stores, right? A lot of olive oil and um, and vinegar stores. And I think what you have to do is always buy glass in a glass jar, of course, and buy small because the second you open it, we start to lose, you know, the, the, the nutritional value, uh, and it starts to um, become rancid. But it's how it tastes, it's how it tastes. It should taste, like I said before, <clears throat> very peppery and almost dirty. It, it, when, when it gets to the back of your throat, it should burn. Those are the polyphenols, right? I, I, I'm very lucky. I have a friend who sends me olive oil from around the world, so I have a little collection of olive oil, because people know I love olive oil and honey, so I have a collection of olive oil and so honey. So healthy stores have, like, not yeah. Oh. And, and you can get good olive oil at grocery stores. You just have to, you're going to get what you pay for, right? But if you buy something and you buy a specific brand and you take it home and it doesn't have that specific flavor, it's cut with canola oil. Because what, before we had money, I read a great book on olive oil, The History of Olive Oil, and olive oil was a source of um, tender. They used it for, for uh, rewards and as a money source. Very interesting it's, it, in that regard. Yes. Uh, so for the olive oil, then they have to be virgin olive oil. Well, yeah. I mean, that's. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it should taste. You want it to have that specific taste. Then you know you're getting the good stuff. And, and it will always be more expensive. And the other question is about the milk. 
So the almond and the soy milk will be... Well, again, if you're going to get soy milk, if that, you want it non-genetically modified and organic, right? And <coughs> almond milk, people see, tend to do well with it. I mean, we all like something in our coffee, right? So I, I think that's fine. And it's low in calories, so it's usually really acceptable. But I, I just have to... Some things you have to take for a label. If, it, if I get that organic label on it, I just have to assume that it's the best it's gonna be. Right. I, 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 I'm not that crazy yet that I'm, I'm growing my own almond trees, right? <laughs> Thank you. Yes. What about avocado oil? Avocado oil. Well, I think it's better to eat the avocado itself. I mean, avocado oil is great, depends on how you wanna use it. I have a lot of different oils when I'm cooking. You like salads? Yeah, it's great, but I just tend to eat the avocado. And my daughter taught me a great trick with avocado is when you, half is usually a serving. It's I, once I cut it, I put olive oil on a little plate and I put it upside down and then it doesn't turn rancid. Mm -hmm. The good olive oil protects it. So then I have it for the next meal because I put it back in the refrigerator. Mm -hmm. And I store all my all avocados in the refrigerator so they, you know, they, they ripen much slower. Right. It's, it was a great trick. Yeah. Yes? The gentleman was talking about uh, exercise, and uh, one of the things that really helped me to lose a lot of weight was when I, after I exercised, I would wait about an hour before I ate anything because I could still feel the burn, especially when I did the strengthening uh, with the weights. Mm -hmm. And then I would eat something light. If I waited, oh, I 100% agree. I mean, if you're exercising, the increase your calorie needs for your body, right? You're increasing your basic metabolic rate. Mm -hmm. Don't feed it food. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, because you're trying to make your body break down fat. Mm -hmm. That's the point. You're trying to make it break down fat. And so you have to think in my so, head, okay, I'm exercising, I'm doing this walk, I'm doing, the, I'm doing these mm -hmm. weights so I have a better metabolism. Fast. You, you, you're gonna be hungry. Drink water, right? Have some green tea. But be happy you're hungry, that's a good thing. Again, we're not starving, but we're hungry. Yes? When it comes to ladies and they have that, do they have problems with the digestive system? With babies? Babies, yeah. Well, I don't practice pediatrics, but I have read some articles where sometimes these um, are, we know that babies get their natural microbiome from mom, right? They get it through a vaginal delivery because of all the natural organisms the mom has in her vaginal tissues. Baby gets it from the skin, from, from nursing, right? So cesarean section babies don't get that, and now they're smart enough after delivery that they'll use some of those secretions and they'll put them in the mouth, you know, in the nose, so the baby can develop a microbiome. So I, I have read and or watched one lecture where they're even giving probiotics to some babies because of that. Again, I don't practice pediatrics, but this is what I have read. And it makes sense to me. I like things that ring true in my brain, right? Any other questions? Yes. If the person has to be like, what was that? I'm sorry. If the person has to be a, a small amount, four or five times, if there's a meal, like half problem with a red flag, hernia, or something, you have a lot of problems. So usually in the morning, um, usually in the morning, I drink the water before I have a bread. I I have been in omeprazole, pantoprazole, and I drink more water. Uh, and this and this and that just depends on your circumstances. So you know, you, I don't know if you have a functional dyspepsia, mm -hmm. or that's why the the PPI may not be helping you. Well, that doesn't really mean it makes yeah. We can add a test to see the so far. So the, you know, there's a lot of they look they do pH but they monitoring and a small amount. Yeah. But I don't know exactly how much has to be because it's well, full of the time. And that yeah, talks about that, you know, I was mentioning the functional dyspepsia. I think that you could try some probiotics and digestive enzymes and see if that helps, right? Chew your food better. Don't over, don't put too much water in your stomach. Put food in your stomach, right? Because you don't want to be reflexing because now your stomach is too full. You know, and, 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 and when it comes to your weight control, you still restrict the hours that you eat. That's the because I'm trying to eat more vegetables and I'm really... Mm -hmm. I and you, and you'll probably do better with cooked foods and soups. Yes. 
Because uh, I, I say this to people in the hospital all the time. I know, I know. That, that it, is a, it is a challenging condition. Yeah. yeah, it definitely is. Vitamins help? Well, if I'm not eating properly. Correct. They will support your micronutrients. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's the name of the uh, painkiller that you said? What was that? The name of the painkillers? I'm sorry. The painkillers. Pain 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 oh, the, the low dose naltrexone. It's not a painkiller. All right. it, it, it's a very complex lecture, which I can't even go into now. But if you Google low dose naltrexone, mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that you can read and learn about. Yeah. Yeah. Can you spell it off on Yes, we'll cover it as much as that right now. Low yeah, we'll get it for you later. Yeah. I, I, think, I think we've covered most everything. i got to go make hospital rounds. She does have to go. Yes. We, uh, and remember that we have this every month, and that's what we're going to cover right now. How about a big thank you for having us? May 18, but we also got our bioclinica here. So, as you might know, there's not a medicine right now for fatty liver. And many people have fatty liver, they don't know where they're at on the spectrum, they just know they have it. So, we do a fiber scan here to see one to four where you're at. Yeah. And depending where you're at, you know if you have to be a little more aggressive taking care of the fatty liver or if you're going to monitor it. But, Stacy, go ahead and talk to them. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Um, Good morning. So, yes, we will be presenting. Um, a month from now on the 18th, Amazing. May 18th. At 9.30, we're back to our 9.30 time, okay? <laughs> yes, and um, what we'll be discussing is fatty liver and NASH, which is non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Um, 